Vanessa and I would like to give you an overview of what McKnight Lectures is going to be about uh, this year in particular. So maybe perhaps one of the first questions is why shame, why sexuality? Community, that's a, that's a safe enough word. But when you start talking about shame or vulnerability or sexuality, then oftentimes people in the church get nervous about that. In fact, some think that that's not a place, uh, that's not a subject for the church to even talk about. That that is, should be relegated to the home, to wherever, and not really the church. I I have to disagree with that. I think the church, if if the scriptures are true, and we believe that they are, and if we believe that they answer all the questions that life presents to us, which we believe, then why would it not speak into shame? Why would it not speak into sexuality? Why would it not speak into every issue that as a human being in Christ, you and I face? So we believe the Bible does speak explicitly, as well as oftentimes implicitly, in the Word about those subjects. And so uh, it was with that in mind and the cultural um, context in which we now live it seemed very appropriate and timely for us to have folks come in and share with us uh, what the scripture has to say about such issues as shame. See, part of the nature of shame itself is isolation, which would be one reason shame would say to us, don't talk about that. Don't talk about that in church. You'll be embarrassed. Uh, You don't want to be that vulnerable in front of other people. Well, the truth of the matter is, for us to be free, and I mean free in, in the way that Jesus talks about in John 15, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What that means is, everything has to be on the table to be completely free. And we all have shame. We all experience shame. And so to talk about that and to talk about even the way the Scripture speaks of that, because the Bible does very definitely speak about shame and vulnerability and community, then hopefully we can open up safer places, this church being one of them, where we can be vulnerable, where we can express our shame, and where we can be loved and heard and our needs felt in a way that for so many of us, only God can do, and many of us never feel that, even from God, which is, by the way, we entitled it known uh, to be known. Because it's true, God is omnipotent, He's omnipresent, He, He knows you and I. The question is, do we know how He knows us? And and still loves us, and still dotes over us, and still sets his affection on us when he knows everything about us. So he knows that. Sometimes we don't know that because shame and the obstacles that stand in the way of being known by God. And that's one of the reasons that we want to speak specifically about sexuality because the brokenness that occurs in sexuality is a monster obstacle to being known. It lives in isolation. It wants to be hidden. The gospel wants to expose that so that we might have that kind of freedom. Next slide. So we want to look at the shame that isolates us And that is particularly what Dr. Kurt Thompson is going to talk about uh, next week during the McKnight Lecture. Uh, Next slide. He's also going to do a workshop, Wired for Connection, next Saturday, primarily for practitioners and educators, but for any of you who really would like to dive deeper into this subject, and the subject is this. Uh, neurobiology, spiritual formation, and vocation. One of the other pastors said earlier this week, he said, I'm trying to figure out what those three have in common with one another, and I'm, I can't wait to hear Dr. Thompson talk about that. 
I think that I have read just about everything that Dr. Thompson has written, listened to him a number of times on podcasts and other lectures. He has such an amazing way to communicate pretty uh, extensive concepts in simple ways so that people like me, so that I could understand it. And I did. And I, so I think if you have interest in that area and you want to know what it looks like, I'll just give you this taste. You might hear neurobiology and think all science, all medicine. One of the things that Kurt Thompson says is everything that we're learning in the field of neurobiology was always there. And it was always there in Scripture from the very beginning, from the moment God created mankind, it was there. We're, we're just using, he says, another language to talk about what the Scripture already talks about. So he spends an enormous amount of time talking about story and how important story is to each one of us. And I hope you've heard here from time to time we talk about this meta story that God is working through called redemptive history. And we're all a part of that. We all have our own stories. They're all interacting with other people's stories. And they're all integrated with God's larger story of redemption. So if you're interested in that, you can go to the website, sign up for that this coming Saturday from 11.30 to 3.30. Uh, Dr. Thompson's going to be speaking a couple of times doing a, a workshop on shame. And we have several other folks that are coming in as well to do workshops. And you can see those on the website. Uh, there's a little bit of information about uh, uh, Dr. Thompson. Uh, he is a psychiatrist. He is an author. Uh, he is a uh, pastor, teacher, elder in his uh, Mennonite church in Washington, D.C. He lives in northern Virginia and practices there. He has a wife and uh, one child, I believe. And uh, we're just, we're, I can't tell you how thrilled we are to have him here. You're, uh, in just a second, you're going to hear just a, just a small clip uh, from Dr. Thompson, and he is not only provoking, uh, but he is uh, extremely encouraging in the way he sees the world and how God is at work and wants to be at work in the world and attacking the things that might keep that from happening. So I want to encourage you to come next week and hear him. Uh, also, we have um, on the third week, Harvest USA coming in. And uh, Vanessa is going to talk a little bit more about the sexuality piece. We also have a workshop on Saturday, July the 27th that she is going to describe for you as well. So I won't say any more about that. And then finally, we're uh, the last week on August the 4th, we want to talk about community. So the reason uh, community is even in there and the reason that it's at the end is as and you will hear Dr. Thompson speak of this often next week, and I'm sure you're going to hear Harvest as well. The kind of learning, the kind of uh, atmosphere that one needs in, in order to expose shame and to be vulnerable is a community. Because shame, by its very nature, wants to isolate people, that's not where you are healed from shame. You are only healed in loving, caring community where that can be expressed and you can be loved. Well, if that's not the church, where else could it possibly be? And so we want to explore ways that we as a church can be a community. Not, I mean, you're not going to probably be too vulnerable in a room this size with all of these folks here, right? But uh, is it possible that you might be in a group with other people who love you and cherish you because you're you? And working through some of the things that shame you. There's no one in here, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but there's absolutely no one here that does not experience shame. And so we all wrestle with that. The question is, what happens to it? How does it define us? How does it direct our life, our conversations, our actions? And what can the gospel say? How can the gospel speak into that? And that's what we want to explore. And we're going to, do, we're going to look at that with uh, a, a young man who uh, I, I've come to love, mostly because of his relationship to adoption. Um, Jason Kovacs, uh, for a number of years, uh, was in Austin, Texas, created a counseling ministry there. Uh, he went back to his roots recently in Vancouver, uh, and he is now residing in that area with his family. He has a practice there. Uh, he is particularly interested in soul care. 
In other words, what, what can he do? How can he minister to people that cares well for their soul? He knows a lot about community. We're excited to have Jason here on August the 4th. Let me talk just a little bit about shame and then Vanessa will come up and talk about sexuality and I'll close uh, quickly on um, community. Dr. Thompson, uh, if you've not read, and many of you probably have not because you just haven't had the time, The Soul of Shame, it is a book well worth your time and your energy and you can, as I mentioned, you can uh, pick up that book outside. Here's just a little tidbit or two. Thompson says, we deeply long for connection to be seen and known for who we are without rejection. Everybody wants that. But we are terrified of the vulnerability that is required for that very contact. And shame is the variable that mediates the fear of rejection in the face of vulnerability. Now this is where where he takes a hard turn right and gets into the heart of the gospel. But in the Trinity, we see something that we must pay attention to. God does not leave. What keeps us from sharing the deepest things? Ultimately, we're afraid someone's going to leave us. Listen, from the time you and I came out of the womb, that has been the issue for us. So you hear all the talk in, in um, counseling circles about attachment theory and all. That's all that means. So when I was born, I was looking for my mama. And not too long after that, I was looking for my dad. And that's why we are so affected by our moms and our dads and our families. And so we start talking about family of origin and all of those issues. Because we were reaching, we were grasping at at our youngest age. Because that's what human beings do. God does not leave us. No matter what we do. No matter who we are. No matter what we say. He goes on to say, The loving relationship shared between Father, Son, and Spirit is the ground on which all other models of life and creativity rest. I mean, that's a packed sentence. In this relationship of constant self-giving, vulnerable, and joyful love, shame has no oxygen to breathe. Understand what he's saying? So when we're tracking fully engaged with God in the fellowship of that community that we call the Trinity, uh, shame has no oxygen there to breathe. It just chokes it out. So that's part of the community that we want to look at. He goes on to say, for if relationship with Jesus is as much about being known as it is about knowing, we soon learn that life with God is not about being right but about being loved. Now, we're good Presbyterians, and we like to know what we know, right? And we like to be right about what we know. And Dr. Thompson is pushing back against that a little bit. He's not saying that knowledge is is bad. He's not saying that at all. He's just saying it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is to be loved. To be loved in God, i.e. to be known by God. And that's what um, he says. There are many other quotes. I just want you to hear him for just a second, just uh, momentarily. for them. If it were not possible for you to be ashamed in inappropriate ways, if it were not possible for you to be afraid of being abandoned, how many new ideas would you offer? What new risks would you be willing to properly take? How would we then be able to live out, not just as churches, but live out in all of our vocational domains, that picture of the body that Paul paints in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where he describes what it means to live in a group of people in which shame is not going to exist, that we don't say to someone else, we don't need you, nor do I allow myself to say, I'm not enough for this group, whether it's my ideas my innovations, 
or even my fears? What will those things be that we will co-create if shame is not allowed to be a part of the conversation? What will it mean for us to be people who are creating outposts of goodness and beauty in long-term permanent ways, practicing, persevering in community such that we live the kingdom that is coming but that is not yet? And that's my invitation. Thanks be to God. So Dr. Thompson there was speaking at the Center for Faith and Work, and we have done work here in our own church with Faith and Work. And um, so hopefully that was just a little teaser to uh, encourage you to come back either uh, next Saturday to the workshops and to the seminars that he's going to be providing and or next uh, Sunday when he is going to be preaching from Jeremiah 1 and also uh, leading the McKnight Lecture on Shame. Tim Keller Uh, writes this, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. What's interesting to me is over a year ago we began thinking about this subject and what we were going to do. I started seeing lectures given, books written, things said that had to do with this being known and being loved by God that really had nothing particular to do with what Kurt Thompson is doing or what Harvest is doing. And what I gleaned from that was that this is a significant issue for all of us in our journey. Keller was writing a book on marriage and talking about what it means to be fully known by God and to be fully loved by Him. It's hard to make a marriage a great marriage without being fully known and loved by God. It's very difficult to love and to know someone else in that way if you haven't experienced that from God. So in many different ways, I I have seen this idea of being known by God and being loved by Him pop up over the last 10 or 12 months as we have been preparing for this particular McKnight series. I just want to finally say this, and and then I'll um, uh, ask Vanessa to come up. The work in Genesis 2 and 3, 1, 2, and 3, are amazing as it relates to shame. So if, if I could give you some homework to prepare for next week when Kurt Thompson comes, I would encourage you to go read Genesis 1, 2, and 3 again, And look for shame in it. And see how shame came onto the scene at such an early point in the development of humankind. And what was God's answer to that? It's uh, it's pretty phenomenal that in one moment, Adam and Eve were without shame and without clothes, without anything, Nothing that we would use to protect ourselves today. They were without shame. But when they sinned, shame came into the picture, encouraged, deepened by the evil one, and they felt and experienced shame. You know, God knew where they were in the garden, right? That wasn't why He was asking, where are you? He wasn't asking, where are you directionally? location, what's your GPS? He was asking, where are you? What sin did to them? Took the death of his son to eradicate. And we want to look at ways over the next several weeks where we can access that perhaps in some new ways so that we can eradicate more and more of the shame. It it will be here until Christ comes. But wouldn't it be great to know how to deal with it a bit better in a more healthy way and experience some more of the freedom that God wants to provide for you? Two other quick thoughts about biblical text. John 9, the man born blind. Maybe you could read that one too as you're doing your homework for next week. Uh, who, Who sinned, this man or his parents? Right, the Pharisees asked. There was a community there. It was not a very healthy community. 
They were trying to find fault. Would you not expect there to be joy and jubilation at a time when a man who was born blind could now see? But that wasn't the story, was it? Shame entering into that and taking people in places that were abnormal. It was an abnormal reaction for what God had just done to give this man sight. That community was unable to see that. Uh, finally, John 21, where uh, Jesus reinstates Peter. We know that story. He asked him three times because he denied him three times. It's a, it's a wonderful story of how God wants to reinstate us. Even though we've disappointed, even though we've shamed, He wants to eradicate that and to lift us up and to take us to new places like he did with Peter. Those are three uh, of many, many, many biblical cases where this whole idea of shame pops up and the gospel speaks into that. Vanessa, would you come? Good morning. morning. I've got to tell you that it's a... I'm, I'm chuckling a little bit that I'm having this talk not out of shame, Mike. But you'd have to know that in my house, this, this topic of sexuality is just a topic like everything else. And so there are really no bounds as to what we'll talk about over dinner or it's just a pretty natural thing. So much that when my kids were in school, um, in middle school, they bring, other, bring their friends to me and say, Mom, their mom won't talk to them about this. Would you tell them about it? I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 no. No, no, no. That, that's not how that goes. That's not how that goes. Let's, let's ask mom, and to which mom would say, oh, sure, yeah, tell her. Please tell her about it. <laughs> so it is my joy to, I mean, so I've graduated. I've graduated. Now I'm talking to Presbyterian churches about, <laughs> about sexuality. It's like, this is a good thing. It's a good day. All right, so as Mike mentioned, Sexuality plays a unique role in being an obstacle to being known. And and it's because admitting sexual brokenness can be so very shame-inducing. And sexuality has the potential to be that uniquely formidable obstacle to good gospel-centered community. And so it often isolates those who struggle and just effectively allows them to spiritually languish in, in fear and in shame. And scripture is clear about what we are to do in face of sexual sin. Mike has given us lots of great scriptural passages, and I'll add one more. Brent? So how are we to respond to sexual sin? Well, we are to flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So an organization called the Barna Group is an evangelical polling firm who focuses on these trends amongst the evangelical community. And they those who self-identify as Christian in a wide array of categories. And so when seeking to understand sexual brokenness among Christians, here's some of what they found that porn use among Christian males um, kind of breaks out like this. 51% over the age of 13 use pornography at least once per month. 63% of ages 18 to 30 view pornography several times per week. And 7% of ages 31 to 49 have looked at porn while at work in the past three months. That means there's a compulsion that has led to risky behavior. And 35% have had an extramarital affair. Now, before you say I'm I'm ganging up on guys, um, it may surprise you to know that the fastest growing demographic of porn users are women. So when polling women, um, 33% over the age of 13 use pornography at least once a month. 21% aged 18 to 30 view pornography several times per week. And 25% of married women watch porn at least once a month. Only 13% of self-identified Christian women say they have never watched porn. 
And porn use is just one of these ways that sexual brokenness is out in our community. Um, it also shows up in surveys of matters of sexual identity. Studies show that 7.2% of young adults identify as gay, lesbian, or bisexual, and 0.6% self-identify as transgender, which means that a person's biological sex does not correspond with how they self-identify. So, how are these matters of sexuality playing out among our youths? 85% felt uncomfortable sharing their sexual struggles with their parents. Well, I mean, that's no surprise. But also, 81% feared being viewed as disgusting by family. 57% feared being disowned by their parents. That Mike mentioned. 42% were forbidden to share their sexual struggles with others. And 9% were kicked out of their home. And so a large part of the homeless population um, self-identify as LGBT. So then, what does all this mean? According to the numbers, in the average multi-generational church, a large number of people struggle sexually. And among them, a significant number of them struggle with same-sex attraction. These sexual struggles represent obst obstacles to being known and to living out this authentic, God-centered, God gospel-centered community that Mike was, will talk to us more about, but that we were designed for. Then what does this mean for the church? How do we as a church whose mission is to restore people, how do we come alongside the sexually broken and be a place of hope and healing? Well, Harvest USA is an organization, a ministry that's been asked this question for a long time. Harvest was founded in the early 80s, at the height of the 80s. And they were founded to minister to the same sex attracted. And since then, they have expanded their ministry to be more comprehensive in that now they come alongside churches and they teach churches how to better care for and disciple those affected by sexual brokenness in its many forms, including same-sex attraction. Saturday, July 27th, Harvest will be here. I'm excited about that. It's a great opportunity for us. They'll present a one-day conference on shame and sexual brokenness. The workshop descriptions are in your, they were in your seats on the, the little flyers, but the workshops include why does the church need to talk about sex? Sexuality and the single person. What's wrong with looking at porn? Parents, kids, and talking about sex. Same-sex attraction and a biblical view of change. Women's sexuality and the church. Understanding gender and transgender gender struggles biblically. And protecting your family in an internet world. So there's a little something for everybody. Very relevant topics. July 28th, Ellen Dykes, Harvest Women's Ministry Coordinator, will talk to us about relational wholeness and how Christ displaces the idols in our hearts. Um, that picture um, of Ellen from a couple of weeks ago when she was in China. Ellen is a gifted counselor and teacher, and she goes all over the world with this message of um, relational wholeness and sexual wholeness uh, through, the, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. When it comes to us on the 27th, she will be in Ecuador. She leaves for Ecuador to also carry that message. And so we are have her come and share her wisdom and her great skill um, with regard to this topic on relational wholeness. The truth is that a church can have all the right answers from the Bible and yet have no connection to those among us who languish in isolation, paralyzed by fear and shame. Being a church that is hospitable means that we actively care for those who struggle. Now, hospitality is more than offering a friendly greeting and a good meal. Of course it is that. Absolutely it is that. But it also means that we have an openness that says that your story, with all of its messiness and all of its brokenness, is welcome here 
because the gospel is powerful enough to handle it. Mike's going to come talk to us about community. So our last McKnight lecture on August the 4th will deal in particular with community and how that community is developed. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Jason Kovacs will be our speaker and talk about gospel-centered community. What does that look like? I, I can just tell you what our vision is. Um, our vision is, you, most of you, perhaps many of you know that we have a ministry here called Safe Places. And it's a ministry designed to uh, allow people who have particular kinds of needs. It could be uh, sexual brokenness needs. It could be uh, marriage needs. It could be infertility. It could be a number of things that, uh, that, that we all struggle with from time to time. And it's a, it's a place, an avenue for people who are wrestling through that to get some help and to walk with others through that. Uh, what we've found is um, that we have been a bit too passive about that in the past and just kind of had it on our website, and this is, this is, we have this if, if you need it. What we, what we believe is that God is a- asking us, calling us to be a little bit more proactive in the way that uh, we offer a safe community for people who are wrestling with any kind of particular need. So... Our vision is at some point down the road, not sure exactly when this will happen, probably uh, 2020, early 2020, we're going to rebrand Safe Places. And uh, Vanessa and I, we're actually leaving tomorrow to go to Raleigh to spend some time with a church uh, there, the Summit, who does a wonderful job of providing these uh, kinds of opportunities for folks to get together so we can learn a little bit more from someone who's been doing it for a while and doing it well. And our hope is that Jason will, will cast that vision afresh and anew for us when he comes on August the 4th, and that, uh, that God will show us how he wants us to be a healing community, how he wants us to be a place. So oftentimes, you, you never know those are happening, right? Because they're, they're in a room somewhere, they're, they're in an office somewhere, they're in a home where people... Christians are gathered together and walking through hard times in their lives. Uh, we're encouraged about what, what might happen through that and ask you to pray for us as we're working through that. I did want to share this uh, passage of Scripture with you from Hebrews chapter 12 as a model, actually, for fighting shame. You know the passage. It's very familiar to it. Did you know that it has shame in it? Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He scorned the shame of the cross. And He is all about helping us scorn the shame that often cripples us and keeps us in isolation and keeps us from the freedom that God so wants us to have. And the next slide, I, just that phrase, fix our eyes on Jesus. That's the prescription right there. Watching him. Doing what he did. Intentionally seeking out our shame to expose it, to reframe it in light of our Father telling us that we are his daughters and sons and that he is indeed pleased with us. That's the message of the gospel. To this God whom we meet in Jesus, we must direct our attention, Kurt Thompson says, if we are to know the healing of our shame. We must literally look to Jesus in order to know how being loved in community brings shame to its knees and lifts us up and into acts of goodness and beauty. 
That's God's design for you and I. In this series, we want to see how God can use a committed group of people to corporately make space, to create undivided hearts, scorning shame and pushing it to the margin of our lives. To put shame to death requires being part of such a community. You cannot do it alone. You were never intended to do it alone, nor were you ever intended to live alone. God's purpose was for us to be in community with one another. I was mentioning earlier, and I'll close with this, that I was out looking for things, and you know, it's somehow when you buy a particular car and you start driving that car, and then you realize you, you cannot believe how many people in the world have that car. <laughs> now, they always had that car, you know, it just you never noticed it, right? Because your context was not the same. So when I started looking at being known by God, I started seeing it everywhere. So one of the greatest books of the last century was J.I. Packer's Knowing God. And uh, that book has helped countless millions of people. He didn't say it probably in the same way Kurt Thompson will say it next week, or Harvest USA will the following week, or Jason Kovacs. But he does say it in this way, and I think it's very profound What matters supremely, therefore, is not in the last analysis the fact that I know God, but the larger fact which underlies it, the fact that He knows me. I am never out of His mind. I know Him because He first knew me and continues to know me. He knows me as a friend, one who loves me. And there is no moment when his eyes are off me or his attention distracted from me and no moment, therefore, when his care falters. The next three weeks are all about you and I understanding that on a deeper level and applying it to our lives. Let me pray. Father, we do thank you for your love for us. We, we know intellectually that you love us not because of what we have done, but that is often very difficult for us to feel and to experience in our heart. So when we haven't lived all the ways in which it would please you, When we sin, when we experience shame, in our sexual brokenness, Lord, you still love us. You never leave. You you go nowhere. You're always there. And to the degree that our shame and lack of vulnerability keeps us from appropriating your great love to us, uh, would you... Raise that up for us during this series. Highlight for us our shame. Highlight for us the ways that we have not been vulnerable. But only to the extent that you highlight for us your great love and that you will destroy. You will destroy shame in our lives so that we can experience in a deeper way this great love that you have for us. Would you do that? And uh, you will be honored and glorified in that. And we, we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. We pray these things all in the Son of your name who made all of this possible for us. Our Lord and Savior and your great Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. See you next week.